you know, don't settle. If you get something, don't settle for what you have. If, you know, challenge yourself yeah. to see if you can improve on it. Why not? And see if you can make it actually work better. Hey guys, welcome back to the Making Magic Podcast. I'm Sean Jay, your host, and I'm a professional speaker, magician, and 3D designer. And this is all about inspiring interviews with the movers, the shakers, the visionaries, and the makers. The wizards behind the curtain that make the magic for you. Now, if this is the first time tuning into the show, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this stuff. It really does mean a lot to me. This is a labor of love and a project of passion. So when you choose to click the subscribe button below because you know you want to, that is how you do it. That's how you support the show. Maybe you've already subscribed to the show. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for supporting the show. Maybe you uh, just listening to the sound of my voice on and a podcast app like Spotify, or we just got listed in the Apple iTunes podcast app thing, you know, the purple icon on your phone, your watch, or your iPad. If you go there and you search Making Magic with Sean Jay podcast, you'll find me there and you can download, listen to new episodes, and hopefully you're enjoying the show and maybe you'll decide to give us a healthy five-star review, which would be greatly appreciated if you do rate and review the show. So now let's learn about our next guest. She has been performing in top venues across four continents, from Europe to Japan to America to the showrooms of Las Vegas. She's also been featured in countless American network TV specials, such as the PBS series, The Art of Magic, and Mysteries of Magic, Magic's Greatest Illusions on TLC, Grand Illusions, The Story of Magic for Discovery, and most recently featured in two new documentaries called Women in Boxes and A Magical Vision by Montrose Productions about the great magical philosophers. She was also the recipient of the prestigious World Magic Award as Best Female Magician in 2007, which aired nationwide on Prime TV on the Fox Network. She's also a philosopher and a teacher of magic, and her many talents encompass music, writing, dance, performance art, and poetry. She's an innovator and an entrepreneur, and she's in a category of her own. Come and see the many faces and phases of my next guest, Luna Shimada. Check it out. Hey, Luna Shimada, thank you so much for joining me here at Making Magic. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. This, this How are is you gonna, today? Thank you. This is, yeah, I'm doing great. This is going to be a really fun chat. We're going to talk about creativity, which you possess a lot of. You have a lot of unique talents, and we're going to talk about those. And hopefully that'll inspire uh, people to, to get creative and start thinking outside the box. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know you very well, and, and you're a great uh, candidate for this here. So I'd like to um, open up the show with a story, and I'd like you to tell us, tell the viewers and the listeners a story about the very first thing that you ever created, invented, built. Uh, this can be magic-related, or it doesn't even have to be magic-related, but I know there's a lot of different uh, magical pieces that you've created over the years. So uh, if you can go back and think about the first one, and this could be good, this could be bad, or uh, funny stories are always welcome too. Well, um, I think that um, I would have to say that just uh, the pre creating the creating the context uh, of an act is probably you know one of the most um, uh, creative endeavors that I jumped into. Now, I've co-collaborated with many magicians in my life. I started on stage at uh, age 11, assisting my father. So um, I learned how to, to set his whole show and how to repair his props 
and things like that. And then I had a 10 year career with my first husband, James DeMare. And, um, you know, we built a lot of our own props for our act as well. I think one of the things about being a magician, as you know, is that we have to be able to do uh, multiple things. We have to have multiple skill sets. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the some of those skill sets, really important skill sets is being able to sew because you've got to be able to sew uh, costumes. You've got to be able to make all kinds of gimmicks and things like that. You've also got to be somewhat of a MacGyver and know how to craft right. things, put things together. Now, I'm not a craftsman, you know, like I've never learned how to build things from wood or metal or, or anything like that. So most of my props have always been very low tech. Okay. Um, you know, duct tape, Velcro, you know, scraps and pieces of things that I can find uh, in a pinch um, has always been my way it's just kind of how my parents always did it too it's like we'd be in a dressing room and we'd be like oh we gotta make something or fix something or we have a show tomorrow and it's like what do we have around here uh let's see we have tape we have coat hanger and we have some fabric <laughs> right and we just magically create something that is functional for whatever you know our purpose is my mother had seamstress um skills so she was able to make costumes so i learned how to develop those skills that's great at an early age learned how to sew those so are great skills when i was you no know, when i was about 27 i had to create my own act because i was no longer with my husband and i decided to go out on my own and um my father just gave me like some umbrellas you know because i said i think i'll try putting together a parasol act but I had nothing. I had no costume. I had no no props, you know, other than the few umbrellas he gave me. He's like, well, here's some umbrellas, you know, some parasols. So I was like, okay. And I had to go through my wardrobe and find a costume or something that I could adapt. So I think that the, and I had two weeks to do it. That's another wow. thing. <laughs> okay. When you have a really, really tight deadline, because he says your first gig is in two weeks. Um, <laughs> Actually, it was three weeks to be exact. Three oh, okay. weeks, I had a, my first cabaret gig. Got an extra and week. I have an entire act in three weeks. Wow. Yeah, I had three weeks to put together an entire act from scratch, right? So I spent about two weeks thinking about it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which gave me one week to actually yeah. construct yeah. all the props and all the, the costumes and the pockets <laughs> and everything like that. <laughs> so I think that, you know, I had to learn how to figure out because, you know, you have to sort of work it out in your head. What, what exactly, where's everything going to go? How are you going to, um, you know, how are you going to, well, I did a stage act. So a mm -hmm. lot of that was body loads and, and prop placements and um, trying to figure out what props that you need. So uh, I needed a, um, I needed a table. I needed a well table. You know what a well table is? Table it's, with um, a well. Yeah, it's a table that you can drop things into, yes. basically. Yes. And, uh, you know, I mean, you could buy them from a magic shop, but I didn't have time to order something and to wait and see if it would show up and, and if it would actually work and if it was the right dimensions. So, again, you know, I had to run to the hardware store. I had to get myself a piece of wood that was the right shape. I had to buy some fabric, I had to buy glue, I had to buy fringe, I had to put this well together, I had to create this entire well table from scratch um, for this one routine that I was doing. Wow. And I didn't have a table, I didn't have a, now I had like a flat tabletop and no bottom. So I was like, so where am I gonna put it? And then I came up with the idea of using one of those tray uh, stands. You know, mm. that you put your trays on in the mm -hmm. restaurants. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it, it became a very, very functional prop. And it was, and it ended up being really cool for my act because the well, I made the, well the table in such a way that it had like a wedge at the back, you know. But because it was all made out of fabric, mm. when it collapsed, it was completely flat. So I was able to construct the table on stage in front of the audience. I come out with a tray table. Huh. And I would open it in my hand, set it down on the, you know, on the, on the ground, and then take this flat board, 
spin it between my hands like this so they could see that it was completely flat on all sides and then dropped it on top of that stand. Nice. And then, and then I had my, you know, and then as soon as it sat on the stand, the wedge would drop down and I would have my load space. Nice. And I was actually ditching a live parakeet into that table. So it also had to be very safe. Animal friendly. Yeah, exactly. So that was probably the first prop that I had to build like really quickly. Um, But then there was a lot of other things, you know, just little gimmicks. And every time you think, okay, where do I put this? Uh, Let's see, I could put it under my belt or I could put it on this table, but then I need a holder to put on the table. So it's like duct tape, (laughs) duct tape and wire let's see you know what i mean and you're literally you know so i've gotten really good at macgyvering things and putting things together to make them functional because i think that and then what happens is that you you make this like really customized little holder or gimmick or something and it works Mm -hmm. so well that you don't want to mess with it yeah (laughs) replace it with something a little more fancy or well-made you know because it it serves its function no i get it um i mean hey if the audience never sees it and it serves its purpose and it assists you and does it well why why change it exactly like i knew a dove act that that uh was just really hilarious i'm sitting in his hotel room after the show and he's got his coat hanging on the on the door on his bathroom door right with the tails facing out And there's a red, a bright red sock safety pin to the inside of his tailcoat. I'm sitting there staring at his coat and going, why do you have a red sock pinned to the inside of your tails? And he's like, oh, I I decided to add another dove load at the last minute and I didn't have time to make a pocket. So I I safety pinned my sock into my coat. And it worked so well, I've been too afraid to take it out and replace it with an actual pocket. (laughs) <laughs> he could have at least used a matching color, right? You know? Well, that was all he had. And I'm like, but it's bright red. He's like, yeah, no one sees it. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's a great, that's a great point. It's like, you so, know, do, do the best with what you have. And it, if it, if it can accomplish the Well, I'm purpose. all about adaptability, you know, like people want to have, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to always be, be fancy in order for it to be functional no and uh, I had to make a a servant for a close-up table uh, a couple of months ago because I decided to throw this um, close-up routine into the show and decided that it would be much cleaner if I could ditch something you know so that I could end up with you know with with nothing in my hands Mm -hmm. I thought I'm gonna need a servant I need a servant and I had no material had nothing all I had was duct tape so I took a couple of those those masks you know right i had like some black ones that i wear yeah by mask you mean Sanit- oh. you know the, the the masks that we've had to wear you know oh, oh, oh yeah okay yeah, sure. yeah 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 so like i the- had like a pack yeah so i had a, a packet of those so i took like two of those because they have the wire on the bridge right yes the nose i took two of those i taped them together right I bent the wire inside. I made a quasi little pocket out of it and taped it to the back of my table and it worked great. <laughs> you know, that's so, that's really that's really awesome. So this is a modern day thing. We're talking about the K95 yeah. masks. Yeah, yeah. Burn. Yeah. Well, you know, just the regular like flat ones, you know, but yeah. because they're pleated, yes. they're pleated so that you can spread them open, you can, you know, so I thought, you know, I don't have any fabric. I don't have anything. It's like, what do I use? What do I use? Oh. That's. So, again, you know, my mother was like the all-time MacGyver of, of, of you know, prop making. So yeah, that's what you do, you know. You, you, you look around and you, you make stuff out of whatever you can find. No, that's, yeah. I think that's really. And, of course, there are more. Yeah. So that's just a story. That's just an example of, of, of how quickly you can, you know, throw something together if you understand the, the form and the function of, of whatever it is that you need at that moment. Yes. You know, other props, of course, take a little more time. Building a table, building, you know, building something that has a very specific purpose that requires time to build and blueprints and things like that. 
you know, that of course is a whole nother thing. Um, do you I have think questions? Well, I was just going to comment on, on some of the things that you were mentioning. I think these, it's a, just the overarching concept is great of understanding form and function, the function of the form and taking, mm -hmm. looking at things and breaking them down to their basic level. So in your mind, you were going, yeah. I don't have fabric, but what else is made out of fabric or something similar to fabric? Oh, these masks that I keep wearing on my face. Hey, that's kind of like yeah. fabric-like. And then you, there's metal built into this fabric, and you, you use that to your advantage. So you can bend it and form it and shape it. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's yeah. I think that's great because a lot of people are stuck in a limited mindset of going, oh, that's a mask. It's only meant for putting on your face. Right. Oh, that's a fork. You only use it to dip it into the food and to eat it. But you, you know, if, if you think about form versus function, you could take a fork and you could, you could tie things to it. You could wrap things around it. I mean, you can, exactly. you can go on like, and on Like, you know how many times I've wanted to hang something off a, off a microphone stand or off a table, um, you know, and how handy it is to have wire hangers. People hate wire hangers, but man, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have wire hangers because that wire, I always travel with a toolkit, by the way very important when I whenever I go and do gigs mm -hmm. I have you know one of those like shoot you know you ever see one of those those flat like um those flat sort of like hanging storage things that have the pockets in them yeah for like sewing for like, you know, equipment stuff right? sewing or shoe or even like shoes mm -hmm. you know so I have like a small one that's like that and it has all these like pockets in it and it's just it's my little MacGyver kit right yeah. It has rubber bands, it has tape, it has, it has glue, it has safety pins, it has bulldog clips, it has everything that I could possibly need. I even have like a glue gun in there and a soldering gun. And, yes. You know, so when I go to a gig and something breaks, I'm ready. I've got everything I need to fix something. Uh, if I need to add something or adapt something or build something really quickly, I have the tools to do that. I have pliers. Oh, I have a coat hanger. I need a piece of wire to build a, a, a coat, you know, a, 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 to make a hanger to hang this prop or this cloth or this hat sure. onto this microphone stand or sure. onto this pillar or onto this wall, you know? And so there you go. You know, you've got yes. to have those, you've got to have those tools to be able to quickly make something that is going to to work, I need to hang my coat up right here. Um, I'll make a clip so I can hang up my coat. You know, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. are just um, tools of the trade. You know, little tricks and little tricks and things that I've I've picked up over the years. You know, because you you get to a venue and you, it's sometimes they just there aren't things there that you need in order to function. Oh, yeah. So you've you've got to make that. Oh, you know, yes. you've got to adapt. Yeah. Oh, yes. Adaptability really is the name of the game. Adaptability. Um, it's happened to me many times. You show up and yeah. you go, wait a minute, this this isn't right. I need I need X, Y, and Z. And if you're if you're stuck without a repair kit or without these things, you're 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 out of luck. But it's nice to have that and to constantly practice that MacGyver skill because mm -hmm. then you can you can just look around in your environment, start grabbing things, and sooner or later you you have you have this problem solved, you have it fixed, or you have yeah. the, the tool to, to help you accomplish what you're trying to do. And yeah. uh, it was actually really great the way you answered this because you actually answered pretty much the next two questions that I had, <laughs> which was what was the reason why you made it and the reason why was you, you were given the task of uh, three weeks to have your own act, right? Yeah, so... Um... I had to figure out where everything was going to go. I had to figure out uh, what routines I was going to do. You know, first you want to figure out, okay, so I'm going to do a parasol production. So I got to figure out how many loads I can actually have and, and in what sequence. Um, right, without you know, going into too cost, much methodology. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? Then you've got to figure out your costuming. You've got to figure out I don't know, how many silks am I going to need? How many, you know, so those are all the little details that you got to sort of figure out and you got to write it down. Now, if you're a close-up magician, you know, it's, it's the same process, different tools, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
So, Same you know, concept. which is a lot simpler because it's usually yeah. small stuff like cards and coins and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe not quite as, but I, I tell you, I have seen, you know, um, my friend Eric really do some interesting things with playing cards where he will suddenly have an idea and just take a, a deck of cards and start cutting them up into all sorts of weird shapes and stuff and taping them together, hmm. you know? Yeah. And yeah. comes and, and, and will instantly make a gimmick, you know, he'll figure out how to, how to um, do a, a coin penetration through a card just by, you know, just by simply, you know, maneuvering a few cards. And, and, and so I, I admire people that can do that, you know, that can look at, something as simple as a playing card and a coin and be able to create a miracle out of it. Yeah. 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 It's, you know? it's certainly a knack. Yeah. It's a, it's a gift. It's a, now he'd be somebody really good to have on the show too, because he could really talk a lot about that stuff. Okay. You know? yeah, very interesting, but yeah. So, okay. um, I don't know. Did you have anything else oh. you wanted to go elaborate on in that particular topic? Or? Oh, no, no, you, um, you, you really, you really covered it, um, and what you learned from making it was, I would say, mainly the concept of just MacGyvering. That was like the big crash course. Well, that's the big course yeah. on that, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, knowing what you know right now, Luna, what would you wish that you could have told your younger self to prevent yourself from making the mistakes that you made when you were younger, as far as uh, just, you know, mistakes on stage, uh, mistakes uh, building things and just ways to make things more efficient. Any, any uh, just collective life experience? Yes. Um, you would have echoed on in the past? Well, I think that when, you know, I think something that happens to us when we are young, you know, due to a lack of experience, but overreaching and being overambitious, mm. which I certainly was, I had this tendency when I would put routines together to overreach, I would, you know, I'll give you an example. Sure. I want to do a linking ring routine. I want to do every freaking move that I know. So I end up with a 16 minute linking ring routine, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to find a piece of music that's 16 minutes long <laughs> and then realize, okay, I really need to cut. I really need to, you know, refine this like by a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and so that is something that some people have the opposite problem of coming up short yes. with material and ideas. I always had a tendency to have too many ideas and then would have to start chopping, cutting, editing, and down, you know, mm -hmm. downsizing everything. So, okay, I have a 16 minute ring routine that needs to be about four and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You need to trim so, eight minutes off so that. You have to trim and trim and trim and trim, and you know, and then you got to start making some hard decisions because you're like, oh, but I really like that sequence, but that sequence takes five minutes to perform. Damn it! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that when I put my first act together, that three-week crash course in yeah. cabaret act, I put that cabaret act in. In I had three weeks to create it. Um, two weeks to mastermind it, one week to actually put it together and <laughs> yeah. three days to practice it. <laughs> and it was a very, very scaled down, very simple, simple act. But, you know, in a way it was really effective. Like it worked so well because of its simplicity, because okay. the props were simple. The, um, you know, the routines were very, you know, straightforward. And mm -hmm. there was no like elaborate backdrop or set or anything. Nothing was too complicated. So the magic was very clean and very, you know, and, 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 and it didn't feel finished to me. That was the problem. So I had a really good, simple act and it, and I took it to Japan and I performed it for the FISM committee. And they said, we love it. We want you to be on the FISM show. Oh, cool. Gala show. So they booked me for the show. And because it was FISM and it was this big, huge, like magic convention and all the magicians from the world are coming in. Oh my God. And it's my big debut. And, yeah. and, 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 and I got into that mindset where I needed, I wanted to overprove myself. Yes. So my mind got complicated. Yes. So I, I, I started 
revamping the act by cover complicating it. I built this big backdrop. I had this vision of this big backdrop that opened up that I was inside of that all the umbrellas would go into. Wow. And then, you know, I, I added two more routines that I didn't have time to really practice properly that involved like ball juggling and manipulation. And, wow. and then I added another manipulation routine in there that I didn't have time to properly fully master. Oh boy. And I was just like, I just, I bit off more than I could chew. Right. And, right. uh, and I had three months to do all this, right? So it was a very, very stressful process. I pulled it off. I pulled it off. And the act actually looked pretty good. Okay. Even though it was, but it was rough. It was extremely rough. There were a few little technical issues. And mm -hmm. I dropped a couple of things here and there, you know, because I wasn't rehearsed enough. Sure. sure. Um, trying to do too much. So I would say that my advice to my younger self would be to don't modify the act. You should have left it the way it was. It was because that was the act that you got hired for, right? Yeah. And then I showed up with this big, you know, thinking that, you know, that this is going to be Luna's act 2.0, yes, you know, bigger, yes. better, and more improved. Yes. And it wasn't. It just ended up being a bit of a cluster, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss on here. So you could say, say it. yeah, it's fine. Um, but but yeah. it was, it was a, it was a total cluster <laughs> and I was stressed out. And like I said, I just took on more than I could handle and oh my God. So sometimes we overreach, we bite off more than we can do. Um, Got it. And that's so important. It's so important to know your limitations. Yes. Be yes. honest about your limitations. And to remember that sometimes less is, I mean, not sometimes, most of the time, less is more. Yes, because it's people can remember the, the, the simpler act and they can probably describe it easier. There's not much uh, mental gymnastics. It was real direct from point A to point B. Is that yeah. all the other stuff in between? No, I, I, I think the, the good news in your case was having too much material, I think, is a better problem to have than having not enough. Because I've been in both boats before. Uh, and when I, whenever I don't have enough, I find it so much more difficult to find the right thing to add. Whereas yeah. if I start, let's say, with a seven-minute piece that needs to be three minutes, uh, is it challenging to cut all that? Absolutely, but it's nice to have all that extra that you can kind of extra options to go, okay, well, I've got all these options, which ones are the best? And then you just push away the non-essential crap and you keep the best, the core stuff. So, exactly. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, yeah. cool. And so you rocked it out at FISM with this slightly overcomplicated, but still... Uh, sure it was unique and and visually interesting uh you know overall it was just a bad experience <laughs> a mess okay <laughs> but i learned a lot from it i did i did okay i'm glad that i i went through that because um, good yeah you know i came back and i ended up just dropping everything that you know and and going back to a, a much simpler format Yep. And uh, a lot of my magician friends, you know, they said the same thing. They said, the act is great. It has so much potential. But right now it looks like this and you just need to do this. <laughs> and that was exactly how he describes this. You know, imagine this is your act, right? Just tighten it up. Tighten mm -hmm. it up. Get rid of all the gaps. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, that's, that's yeah. great. That's great advice. That's great advice. What about uh, something that you recently have made? Is there anything that you perhaps a... Uh, effect, routine, prop, or something that you MacGyvered together or recently came up with that you don't mind sharing without revealing any methods? Oh. Huh. Uh, other than the mask savant? <laughs> oh, well, well, actually, that's pretty, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty that awesome. Just, oh, no. Um, awesome. I'm just trying to think. That's okay. You know, these days, I am performing in a much more simpler format. Uh, I okay. have for uh, several years now been moving away from a lot of proppy magic. You know? mm. I don't even really perform my parasol act anymore, except on like special occasions. But 
you know, if it's like a really theatrical show and they want me to do it, but I don't mm-hmm. even perform it anymore unless I'm at the castle or something. I don't really enjoy <laughs> doing that kind of magic anymore because it's it's labor intensive. Sure is. And oh, it's yeah. you know, it's 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 labor intensive, it's 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 preset heavy, um, it's prop heavy, you know, hauling all that equipment from place yes. to place. Yeah. And my magic has become so much more psychological now. Oh, okay. And and simplistic, simplistic in its form. Okay. Uh, I still love to perform silent because I love to convey emotions, but uh, I have also been doing a lot of talking routines that have a lot of message in it and, you know, very motive kind of motivational stuff that sort of addresses a lot of like, you know, social challenges and stuff like that. So um, I don't find myself having to build a lot of props for that reason. Oh, okay. Um, so you're what using probably the stuff that you already have, and then you're maybe creating better uh, different concepts for routines around those items. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And scaled so, down as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, I think that that I went from being a prop constructor to a script writer. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And learned that that magic doesn't have to you know, always be, you know, a, a physical thing. It can, you know, it can be a psychological experience. I agree. I agree. And uh, although it is good to have skills to be able to fix things for sure. Yes. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I just like, I'm kind of like in a different space right now with all of that, but that doesn't mean like when I'm working with students and stuff, that I don't have, you know, that I have that, that background and that knowledge base. So, yes. so if someone says, I want to vanish this ball, how do I do it? Well, let's see, we can do this, you know, several different ways. So right. I'll be able to, you know, make that happen. Or, you know, if somebody wants to appear something, well, I've got several methods and ways to make that happen. So the skill set still comes in handy when it comes to helping other people build and construct whatever it is that they're trying to do. Um, okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I wanted to do this card routine um, and I wanted the card at the end to change into a different card. Okay. And that was a, you know, that was a very specific type of gimmick because it, I didn't want it to change from like, I wanted it to change from an ace of spades into a picture actually. And uh, in, not to, into a different card. So I had already, I'd come up with the idea on, on how to do that. And I took it to Eric because Eric is good with playing cards. So I'm just like, hey, can you make this turn into a such and such by doing it this way? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and here are my thoughts about that. So together we were able to sort of engineer this really cool gimmick card, oh, cool. right? That is actually you know, can turn into two different kinds, it can change into two different cards and then turn into a picture of something, you know, so it has three different images. So again, you know, that's just, again, using that sort of mindset of taking, you know, a very basic object Mm -hmm. and wanting it to have multiple functions. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would say that that was probably, you know, one of the more recent gimmicks that, that I worked on. Of course, I made him make it because he likes to make stuff like that. So I'm like, will you make this for me? Right. <laughs> got it. Got it. But yeah, I mean, right. I, I could make it if I myself, if I have to. But, you, you know, you were one the, of the advantages uh, of being a girl is just bat your eyelids and, you know, exactly. delegate that delegate that to somebody else. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yes. Yes. But, you know, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally <laughs> always make my own stuff if, if I don't have a a young, handsome man with skills to do it for me. <laughs> right, right. No, it, that, it, it always helps to have someone on your team that, <laughs> exactly. um, that can pick up, uh, pick up the pieces or, or you know, work right. in areas that you don't feel as comfortable in. It's always, it's always good to, to, it's nice to learn new things, but I mean, if you're really in a jam, it's, it's always smart to delegate to somebody who really knows what they're doing. 
always have adhesive Velcro and a roll of gaffer's tape, not duct tape, okay? Because it's too gluey. You got to have gaffer's tape. And that is a very, gaff tape is a very specific kind of thing. You can't just buy that in like Lowe's or something. You have to actually buy it at a theatrical store. So I highly, highly recommend, you know, you want to have clear scotch tape. You want to have a bottle of crazy glue. You want to have a roll of gaffer's tape. I usually have black and white, mm -hmm. depending on what it is that I, you know, need to make. Uh, because you can literally make an entire surface or cover an entire surface with gaff tape because it's basically made out of cloth. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so um, that is just one of the most valuable tools. Even if you're, in, you know, close up magician, there isn't, there hasn't been a situation where I have not been able to, you know, where I have not been able to use gaff tape to, to you know, for multiple functions multiple cool. applications so multiple applications yeah so you know definitely something good to have in the in the, in the tool belt okay yeah or okay. tool kit yeah okay and are there any specific maker techniques that you would say uh you are best at like you're passionate about i know we talked about macgyvering things is it do you specifically like to work a lot with wire or is it just all about the tape and you have you've got like a thousand and one uses for the tape or maybe there's something um, else no i mean you know tape is just one 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 tape you know one tool but mm -hmm. um uh it again it all depends on what you need like mm -hmm. i i love to work with fire for instance okay right yeah but one of the things that i can't and this is just a me thing this is just because i think magicians should be cool on stage i think that they should do things that are non like they shouldn't do things like ordinary people like bring out a lighter and go flick right, need, right you know what i mean and light something with that right like i think that you know a magician should always have a match pole if you need fire you should be able to just go i have fire you know what i mean <laughs> so i love to make batch pulls match pulls and you know and i've learned how to make match pulls just out of a match box you could just get a match box and again, gaffer's tape and a safety pin. And you take the striker paper off the matchbox and mm -hmm. you roll it up into a, into a, a, you know, like a, you fold it up and then you put uh, tape around that. You, you put a, attach a safety pin to it, right? And then r wrap a rubber band around the outside of that to create pressure. Yeah. And then if you mm -hmm. squeeze it and stick your matches inside, when you pull it, they ignite so you can literally like safety pin that to the inside of your jacket mm. you know to the inside of your cuff i mean you could put it in several you could have you know i've even had people put them on their on their boot under their pant leg and you just reach down and pull a match you know so that's a really fun little thing to be able to do is to just make match pulls and just stick them all over yourself <laughs> you know if you need to have like instant fire you know you you've inspired me to to make my own. I think I I haven't yeah. in that territory lately or at all actually. Oh, like, very important to use wooden matches, not the cardboard ones, and take two of them and tape them together with tape. So yeah, because you want to make sure you got nice sturdy matches, and you want to have two of you know two matches to tape together, so you have a nice big flame when you big pull flame. it out. Yeah, one probably yeah. will break too easy, and the flame will exactly. go out too Yeah, fast. so it makes it strong and sturdy. Okay. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. What about, um, what about the favorite prop or gimmick effect, whatever, that you designed in the past that you can think of? Something specific. Well, you know, I'm not really an inventor like Lysander, you know, is an inventor, um, but he had very specific skills. Like he learned how to actually build things out of wood because his father was a, a craftsman and a carpenter. Right. Mm -hmm. So I again, I think it's it's really cool when people, you know, have that ability because then they, they can literally like, oh, I'm going to build a table that floats. And wow you know voila he there can just is. literally build it you know and it's cool so 
I've never really developed that kind of skill set, you know? I mean, I can take a costume and adapt it to do all kinds of things. I can, well, that's, I can, um, that counts, you know, that counts yeah. big time. I mean, that counts as creating something. I mean, like I said, it could be anything. And I mean, you I know, know, I know your magic. I know it's very unique and visually interesting. So I think you're probably underestimating your own ability, I think. Well, I think, I think that it's, it's probably just, you know, for me, it's just such a normal thing, you know, like quick right. change, quick change uh, acts are very, very popular now. And I know that there's a girl that, you know, that was on, that was recently on uh, Penn and Teller that was amazing. I mean, she did some things that I have never seen any quick change Maria artists Kyle. do. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is super cool. Now, you know, back in the day, <laughs> Uh, when I was doing my illusion show, I had to make, you know, I even did a costume change at the end of my act years ago, you know, and I went from like full pants and, you know, like a full pants, uh, you know, like kind of costume with sleeves and everything into a, into a, a dress. And it was a, you know, it was a very dramatic change, but it was, you know, nothing like that, you know, but again, I didn't need it to be because the act was not about costume change. It was just uh, supposed to be a transformation from one character into another. I see. Know? It was. It was a so I think that I think that that's something that people don't focus enough on these days is that it's it's all about the flash and it's all about the method now. It's all about catch me if you can. Can you wow me? Can you surprise me? Can you, you know, can you guess how I do this and well, um, I mean, you could also, I could also argue that it's the magician's job to try their best to steer the audience away from that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. um, no, absolutely. It's right? important to be able to fool them. But I think that, I think that it, I think that magic can be so much more than that. Oh, know? absolutely. That I think it exactly can be, I think yes. it can. Of course. Yeah. And see, so I'm just kind of one of those people. I'm one of those people, you know, that just wants magic to be, um, a little meaningful. more meaningful meaningful i want to pe i want people to to experience it as something transformative or you know um perspective shifting you know That's as great. opposed to as opposed to it just simply being a challenge like a puzzle or a something puzzle. to solve and exactly yeah. just another puzzle to be solved and right and when... in order for something in order for magic you know for your performance to have texture it has to have story. It has to have mythos, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very, very big on, on context. And context, of course, informs material and it informs what you use, the tools that you're using and how you use them. Good point. Yeah. Points. Yes. Yes. It's, so um... as far as creating, I don't know if I've really created anything. Um, <laughs> you know, specific other than just, I want, you know, ah, I have an appearing cane. I wanted to spin on my open palm. So I figured out how to do that, you know, very, very simply. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's not like I sit there and think about things to come up with things to invent. I don't really have an inventor's mind. Well, you know? you're, you're more of, um, I just, I'm more of a functional person. Like if I have an idea, yeah, then I will, I will, I will come up with a way to do it and it will probably be, you know, pretty original. Well, that's what, that's what I mean. Like practical yeah. problem solving in your own way to get the job. Ex done. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so it's just a matter of sort of breaking it down and figuring, okay, you know, knowing what different methods you can use to accomplish what, you know, that particular type of effect and this kind of going down the list of, of things that, that would work and may not work. You know, I love rubber bands. Rubber bands are great gimmicks. <laughs> you can do a lot with rubber bands. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, you mentioned they have their own section in your, your uh, carry bag, right? Oh yes, rubber band yes. section. Yes, yes. The so I use band. rubber bands for multiple things. Yeah. That's that's probably an overlooked 
an overlooked and uh, and not in a way that people expect them to be used you know even though magicians do they do rubber band magic but you know I use rubber bands in my magic, and you never know that they're rubber bands. So. You use secret, secret uh, applications of rubber bands. No, that that yeah. I like that stuff. I like yeah. taking. Again, it goes back to. I think all of this goes back to this core concept of what makes you special, Luna. Is you don't you, you never look at anything just as it is. You can always see uh, applications of each tool from multiple angles. Rather, yeah. like I said, rather than a rubber band just being to, to wrap vegetables or to hold things together, you can right. take that one form and function and go, oh, well, this thing, it can move this way and that way. Oh, and it can go, you know, five times its shape. Oh, well, I need to connect things here. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's much more yeah. than what people box themselves into. Well, that, and I think that, you know, we have access to so much magic props now. Everybody is making something, putting something out on the market all the time. That takes people's creativity and the creative process away when does. they can just buy a trick. Oh, I want to be able to do that trick, you know, so they can buy it. And a lot of times they're disappointed because they're like, it's just a rubber band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just another rubber band. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like so many times, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've, I bought an effect because I thought it would be cool and then discovered how it was made or what it was, how it was, how it worked and thought, hmm, I could have created something. I could, you know, I could accomplish the same thing uh, a little bit better by, you know, utilizing this, this and this mm -hmm. instead. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will often, every time I buy a magic trick, I will I will either not use it because it doesn't it doesn't I don't like the method or I will improve on it. I will go, well, I don't need this part, but let's remake this. <laughs> so, so you're buying and then it goes back to I could have just made this myself and it would have been more and it would have worked better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with uh, both ways. You know, some people it is. some people choose to, to choose to never even go out and explore the 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 be territory beyond what's there, um, and yeah. if people want to have a commercial act, and people can make money from an act that was put together from from pre-made things, um, and there's nothing wrong with that because uh, it's all subjective. No, but, but yeah. if you do want to take it beyond what already exists and be uh, original and, and show people things perhaps they've never seen before or have your own take on it, then it helps to expand your mind a bit, start thinking in those new ways, the ways that you're thinking, and just start looking at something. And it seems that another concept for you is, is you don't stop thinking too soon. Like, because when you buy something, it's almost like still an unfinished piece to you because you look at it and you go, oh, wait, yeah. that's, a, that's a good starting Almost point. Almost everything that I have ever purchased has been an unfinished thing to me, <laughs> even a grand illusion. I remember buying an illusion from Johnny Gone, like a levitation illusion, and getting it and going, damn, this thing doesn't work right. We're going to have to fix it, you know? Really? Yeah, yeah. And it's, <laughs> and it's like that. You know, you spend $5,000, $10,000 on a prop you think you should be able to roll it out on stage and perform it just like that. Not always the case. Hmm. You know? And so I, I have never purchased a prop that I did not have to modify in some way in order for it to do what I needed it to do. Interesting. Very interesting. You know? And I don't know if that's just me because I'm picky and I want <laughs> my prop to, to serve a particular function. You know? Yeah. Or, yeah. um, uh, yeah, it's, but... it's probably a, a combination being picky, being creative, being a perfectionist with your work, and uh, being uh, very, very, very specific with what you want because probably most people are generally satisfied with what they buy. Um, and, and most people aren't super picky. Um, they just go, I want to do this thing. They get it, and then they do it as per the instructions and they're happy with that 
Yeah. But somebody, um, you know, you have different standards for, for your art and in order to well i just think that i mean the you know the advice that i'm i'm offering up on that particular topic is that mm. you know don't settle if you get something don't settle for what you have if you know challenge yourself yeah to see if you can improve on it why not and see if you can make it actually work better in some way yeah, because that's doing. what I do. I look at it and go, okay, that works, but what if I could make it do this instead? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I've become very good at taking gimmicks and using them for other applications <laughs> other than what they were created for. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, if you could. Well, take I won't it use it for this, but I could use it for this. This then, then it would work really great, you know. Yeah. So, you so use, that's another thing to consider. Is you that the, you know, the, the pre-made silk thing for a water effect. That's like what? Yeah. But. Yeah, but you just. Why not? Yeah, why not? Exactly. <laughs> you know, and then you could create something really amazing with that. You know. Yeah, it's it's so. it's like why versus why not. <laughs> Most people go, <laughs> well, why do I have to take that and and bend it and twist? Why not? <laughs> Let's see what happens, right? <laughs> that's that's the joy of experimenting, and and you might hit a big breakthrough when you do that. Um, it's all ex it's all about experimenting, you know. It's yeah. it's you know that's that's the thing. Is just keep you know keep looking at it you know, from different angles and, yeah. but, you know, knowing what it is that you want to do helps a lot though. But there are some people that are just natural tinkers, you know, and, um, yeah, you know, they'll sit there and go, what if I could do something that can do this? What if I could make something that can do that? What <laughs> if, and it always starts with that. What if I could blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, that's a typical, you know, like, so I know so many magicians that just have that mindset. And I, I admire that because I'm not like that. <laughs> I don't spend a lot of time just thinking about things that I could make that what if I could, do? I don't, I am more of a, you know, like I said, results I'm, driven, I'm results driven. Exactly. So I will only learn the dance steps that I need to learn to do the dance. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to, I'm not going to spend, you know, an entire year learning how to tango. <laughs> if I only need to learn how to do four steps in that tango, <laughs> right. you know, it's like, I am all about, you know, I need something that will do this. So I will focus all my time and energy on that, on creating and developing that mm -hmm. for that specific purpose. Got yeah. it. Got it. Yeah. Great. Nothing wrong with but that. That's, but that's me. You know, that's just me. Everybody yeah. else, everybody's different. So. Of course. Of course. What about, um, what about the biggest, take us back to perhaps the biggest DIY fail of all time, perhaps something that you made or taped up together and, and uh, you were, had high hopes and then all of a sudden it just kind of blew up in your face or fell apart or so just to give you an example like on episode one mario was telling me about he has marcel the robotic monkey and it was sitting on the edge of his briefcase he was in the middle of a large stage show and something with the vibration when he was walking around the stage it shook the suitcase the monkey fell off and it's made of multiple servos and the whole thing just shattered yeah. all on the floor Ooh. and you can't recover from that in the middle of your show. You just have to kind of pick up the pieces and say, oh, I got to do something else now. Think fast. So yeah. um, anything like that ever happened to you? Just something just blows up and then you have to figure out a way around it? No, I don't think that I've ever had something like that happen. But I did like, uh, you know, going back to that FISM show that I did, ah. um, I had this idea I wanted to build this screen that was like a trifold screen and it was made like, you know, and it was a, like a show, you know what a shoji screen is, Japanese shoji screen. It's kind of like rice paper with slats in it. And there you, you know? put a lamp inside maybe? Um, no, but the, no, it's just, it's just like, well, it's just, 
Oh, you, because you I mean, was trying to go with like a Japanese sort of motif, right? So oh, I had this. It's tall yeah. as a person, right? Or a little bit taller than a yeah. person? Okay. okay right. Yeah, so yeah, gotcha. instead of just having like the setup I have now, which is just a central table and a couple of simple stands that I put my umbrellas on, mm. um, I had this, I, I wanted to create this, this backdrop that started out like a cone almost. Right. And mm. then it, and then, you know, it would open up into an entire backdrop and I would be inside of it. Right. Like a, like a was tripod, a, the, yeah. like a thing so with like this. It was yeah. a screen. It was a tri, it was a trifold screen. Gotcha. And gotcha. the screen had a table built into it. Oh, Everything. Wow. Yeah. Because it was slats, it was slatted. It had, hmm like secret doors in it it had secret little like moving doors and it okay. had a secret table in there so i could steal things out of it and, dip, and ditch things into it so in theory and concept it was good but i didn't have enough time to really develop it you know yeah. and because it was you know so this this prop was so um it was so First of all, I had to find somebody to build it because it wasn't something I could build myself. Mm. And we had so little time to really, right. you know, get it, get it actually working the way we needed it to. And it, it, it was on wheels because it had to open. So wow. it had to be pulled open manually with cables. And when it opened up, it was very wonky, you know, so it would open and then it would, and it was right. And then I wanted to stick the parasols into this backdrop so there were little so holes little slats oh, in wow. there so that when i put the parasols into the no, like, backdrop it would hold all these parasols but because it was so wonky every time i would put a parasol in, the whole thing would just like shake like, and you know <laughs> and the audience was like oh my god it's gonna fall over you know and it was like it was it was like that so Ooh. there there was a lot of problems there was a lot of problems with that with that prop did it ever and, fall uh, over it, it, I only ever used it for that one show. Oh, wow. And I never really had a chance to, like I said, you know, work on it. And, and, and it, it, it came over, it was huge. It came over in a huge anvil case, you mm. know, which cost me a fortune to ship over, you know, from mm -hmm. America to Japan. Mm. And then I didn't have the money to get it back to America. So I ended up leaving it in Japan and my father just ended up selling it to somebody. But, um, you know, so that was a, a huge investment, you know, for a prop that just didn't quite do what I visualized it to do. Yes. So I would say that that was, you know, again, overreaching, thinking, you know, in theory, you know, I had all my drawings and diagrams and it's like, it's got to do this and it needs to have this and this and I need a flange and a door here and another door here and a collapsible table that, you know, and a little thingy that shoots a ball out. And, Just a little you know, thingy on the side. <laughs> you know, and it, and it was like. Out of control. Just too much. You no, know, the, the table had to collapse. In, in, for the screen to close up with me inside of it, the table had to be able to fold flat up against the screen. And then oh, when it man. opened, it had to, when it opened, it had to, op you know, it had to like fall open, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like the entire prop was like an origami. Yeah, yeah. Basically. You know, it's like a, really like a, the best a way. Book. Like when you open those books and they have the folded yeah, art that opens That's up. what it was. It was just like, it was like a pop-up book, you know, oh, it had to yeah. open up and all these little things had to come out and, and it had to serve all these different functions. And again, it was, it, it was a cool idea, but I would say that that was a bit of a white elephant, you know, of okay. a, uh, everybody's allowed to have, have those. I mean, I, I have, uh, I had one time I was doing a show where I set up a backdrop that was on a tripod stand and I did not tighten it properly. And I yeah. was in the middle of my show and the backdrop went, first I heard, heard it slide down a little bit <laughs> and then a little more and then dunk and then it dropped and then, I don't know, the wind blew it over. It was just a mess. I had oh to, God, yeah. yeah that's, that, it's pretty, uh, it humbles you really fast. Just takes that ego away Yeah. real oh, quick. Oh, I know, I know. I did do a screen to lie, like a, a screen to life, like a, um, like a um, artist dream illusion once with my dad on stage where I had to step. I was, you know, like he put a painting of me um, on hmm. stage and then it comes to life and I yeah. step out of the frame. Yeah, yeah. But I was in this kimono where these really long 
kimono sleeves. Uh. So when I went to step out of the frame, my foot got caught inside the sleeve of the kimono. And I, I stepped down on my sleeve and I started stumbling out of the very clumsily out of the out of the illusion <laughs> stumble 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 right <laughs> it was such a funny moment but it was definitely like one of those like moments where it was really embarrassing so i'm trying to be all it was a very dramatic moment you know and then i go to step out and oh you know? oh no it was like a three stooges moment yeah i was just like wow okay <laughs> it, it, <laughs> what about... hard to hard to recover from that and still look you know somewhat cool <laughs> that's how uh that's how the great ballantine got his act right he just kept messing up and he was like you know what i'm just gonna oh gonna yeah now. <laughs> that's that's true though you know those parody acts are the best like you don't see those kind of acts around anymore and i veronin i i miss i miss that yeah yeah, it's I, fantastic. I think the best uh, modern two that I'm aware of is Veronin and uh, the great Kaplan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Kaplan. I did get to work with him a couple of years ago. No, Barky. That's okay. A little cupcake back here. Get a little cupcake. Hi, cupcake. <laughs> hey, cuppy. Oh. It's dear. She just blended in with the background there. Look at that. Oh, my God, it's a dog. And now there's a... <laughs> Some moving white thing back there. What is that? Oh, yeah, that's 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 cupcake. It's cupcake. <laughs> it's cupcake. Your magical hey, cupcake. Yeah. Your, I think cupcake <laughs> is your conscience telling you what to do back there. <laughs> well, she definitely upstages me every night in the show. <laughs> and you know, I I I I do this one woman, like this one hour, one woman show. Oh, cool. And, and, uh, this is at the Las Vegas and, Magic Theater. Magic Theater every Wednesdays and Thursday nights. And she's my big production at the end. I produce her, hold her up like that. And I, I mean, that's literally all she does is just, ta da. And people forget about everything that I did last hour. Because <laughs> they're like, oh my God, it's a little cute dog. <laughs> yeah yeah i've i've heard so theories and stories of, of like birthday party performers of they course say. that is of course why i produce her at the end of at, the show at so, the end that's how end. do you follow that yeah 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 <laughs> never produce a bunny in the middle of your show you'll never be able to finish oh yeah they, they won't stop talking about it yeah so anything cute <laughs> anything cute what about the reason i only oh. reason i even put my dog in my show was so that i could travel with her <laughs> that was the only reason yeah not not because i wanted a, a live animal production in my show <laughs> it was because i don't want to go anywhere without my dog so can i bring my dog and they're like is the dog in your show and i'm like um sure yeah i guess <laughs> it is now <laughs> cupcake is Somehow I had to figure out how to put her in the, I had to figure out how to put my dog in the egg so I could travel with it. You know? MacGyvered that one too, right? It's that was like... the only reason that I put a token animal production in my show. The only reason. That's, yeah. hey, well, you, you figured a, a workaround and it's like, you know, have your cake and eat it too. You, you get a bonus <laughs> effect in your show that people find cute and awesome. And then you get to still be with your dogs. Get to right, dog exactly. Cake. Yeah. So why not? Why not? What about, uh, is there anything that you've ever created or came up with on accident? Any accidental, um, you probably make accidental discoveries all the time when you're just maybe MacGyvering something, repairing something. Was there anything like that that turned out to be like a fixture in your show or just something that you do from every time now? Um. I had to put something in my act. I had to I had to produce uh, an extra prop and um, at the last minute and I didn't know where to put it because I literally had nowhere to put it. <laughs> so I came up with a very clever camouflage technique oh. that hides it in plain sight. Oh. So I literally just have to walk to my table and pick it the f up in front of the audience and nobody <laughs> sees it. Nobody ever, ever sees it. And it's that's right great. there in front of your face, you know. The that's great. Time. No, but, that's great. I love it. Yeah. So camouflage. <laughs> camouflage. There's we, we can learn a lot from well, nature. And this, you know, and the thing is that, yeah, if you don't draw attention to it, you know, like I, I am a big fan of hiding things in plain sight. 
Yeah. You know, because yeah, you know, if they don't know where to look, they're not going to, they're not going to see it. And boy, and I thought, wow, you know, because I thought I, it, it, that was one of those moments where I need to I need to produce this, but like where do I put it? I'm just gonna put it right there and and hide it <laughs> and, and hide like it. this, and and not even hide it that well, <laughs> and it worked so well that I never changed it. I just left it that way. Hey, there you go. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it, it was it literally it was literally a, a gimmick that I made in like five minutes from some tape, some fabric, and some cardboard. <laughs> That's beautiful. Beautiful. Now we're going to get to like the kind of the lightning round. I'm going to go a little faster. It's going to be three questions back to back in a row, kind of the same, but we'll have a different answer. So starting with what inspired you to be a maker was it did you get a lot of influence just from the the wonderful amazing opportunity to hang around uh dad like so much and watching a legendary pro just just you know smoothly go through everything and then your uh but your mom as well fixing things and tinkering Pretty much my father, you know, my mom and dad made all their own props. I mean, literally made all their own props. They Perfect. started out with a Dove act and then they got to England and nobody wanted to book a Japanese act, magician doing a Western act. And then some agents there said, why don't you do a Japanese act? Because you're Japanese. And so they literally went to Chinatown that day, bought some parasols, some kimonos, some fans, anything that looked Asian, right? And went home and created, you know, their first Japanese, you know, parasol act, mm. you know, in a matter of days. And literally she just took, you know, they just they just grabbed whatever they could find and they put it all together. So, yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I had the benefit of watching, you know, my parents were both very crafty mm. mm -hmm. and being crafty is important because then yes. you can put stuff together. Now, I have like I said, I very rarely ever buy uh, stuff from magic shops, unless it's like supplies, you know, things like mm. rope and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> reusable stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, flash paper because I don't want to play with, you know, cause I don't want to suck my shit in chemicals. So <laughs> I'll buy that stuff. I'll buy that stuff, you know, right, let somebody right, right. else, you know, uh, um, do that. But, um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I, I learned how to do that because that was my normal, like, you yeah. want to be a magician? You want to, you know, you want to create an act? You have to build your own props. You have to make your own props. You have to make your own costumes. You have to figure it out and then get to work. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, figure I, it out and get to work. <laughs> yeah. So you could just you could you could say that it was my training. Yeah. That's so cool. That's I mean, you know, so many people would just just live a dozen lifetimes to get that kind of opportunity. I mean, it really is. Uh, Necessity is the mother of invention. So many people would, would live 12 lifetimes just to get that kind of experience, being around yeah. legendary pros and seeing, watching them firsthand yeah. do what was needed to get the job done, to, to be put in a, a tough situation. And out of necessity, with the back against the wall, they just go, okay, how am I going to get this done? And they do yeah. it. And then... You, and then so you are the, the watchful student, and that's how you got involved. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Is there anybody specifically that you look up to in the maker space? Like, let's say nothing to do with magic at all. And, you know, I give examples like popular uh, YouTubers that make stuff for their channel, you know, build things. Or, or it could be, you know, a friend or somebody that you know who's uh, good with makers, maker uh, skills that... that you're not good at, but you go to them for uh, advice or inspiration, anything like that? Um, Bizarro is pretty amazing. Bizarro. Yeah, he's a magician here in Las Vegas. He's, you know, very creative and uh, has an, an amazing, you know, set of skills. I mean, the guy can do anything, make anything, you know, from from nothing. And so... Uh, he's sort of my go-to guy. A lot of us local people, you know, local Las Vegas uh, folk um, will uh, call him up when we hit a bit of a, a snag in our creative, you know, 
process hmm. a lot of times you know it's like oh i really want to make this thing but i can't figure out how to make it and mm-hmm. so he's you know he's very clever like that he's just really good at making props and very creative and, and has a lot of knowledge about um because he's he's crafty in ways that i'm not crafty mm-hmm. you know like he can actually make molds and work with latex and he can do all kinds of stuff. Jason Bainey is another guy that makes incredible magic mm. uh, props. And he's also very crafty and very skillful with, um, you know, making, making props and making various types of gimmicks and really good with like making little cards that animate. And just yes. So, so cool. You know, just, um, um, I love that, you know? Everyone. So. All right, so uh, what resources, or, or if you can think of any resources off the top of your head, like if anybody was interested in MacGyvering things or, or thinking uh, in that way to view things with greater possibilities, perhaps maybe you Ooh. have books off the top of your head or anything to watch online, or it can even be an app that you can put on your phone that can help people... Uh, start to think in that kind of way. Well, <laughs> I'm a Gen X. I'm not a millennial. <laughs> I, I'm not from this age, you know? <laughs> so, so I'm a little old school when it comes to that stuff. Um, honestly, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't know if I can really offer resources in that way because okay. I don't utilize those resources myself. Okay. I'm okay. sure that there are resources out there. Uh, you know, I do, I mean, I do have, uh, you know, a, 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 a teaching course and I do have a mentor's program. So most of the time, if people want to learn how to do stuff like that, you know, they learn from somebody and like okay. I learned from somebody. So, Fair so I am always available to teach people how to do that stuff <laughs> if that is something they want to learn. But okay. I think that, you know, as far as making props, you just have to understand magic principles. If you, you know, and magic principles is just, you know, it just comes with your basic sort of, you know, research and development. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to learn the basics. You've got to learn your magic. You've got to learn your magic's methodologies. And once you know what it is that you are trying to accomplish, then the rest of it is just imagination. It's just imagination and and um, reaching out to someone that might know how to do something that you don't know how to do mm-hmm. and learning from them. Mm-hmm. Because that's, you know, that's how I learned. I mean, you can go to school and you can learn things in textbooks, right? And learn mm-hmm. theory, or you can apprentice under somebody and learn in the field. And yeah. I, you know, I'm an example of someone that has learned in the field. Yeah. I, yeah. even if I have no idea how something, how to make something, if I understand what the, what I need it to do, if I understand the function mm-hmm. and I can create, uh, and I can come up with a method, then I can, then I can build it. If I can come I, up with a method. I will build it. I mean, I have concepts in my mind because I have such a good collective knowledge of how, concepts and and methodology works you know right behind certain certain magic method um, uh, magic methods i can go to a prop and i can say hey you know i want to bring a wolf to life and hmm. here's a prop that i designed <laughs> yeah build yeah. it for me like this and i will i will literally have the concept you know already drafted up and then, of course, then then the rest of it is just building little models and playing around with it and seeing if it works and then adapting and, you know, and going from there. So Got it. We, we get better. The more we do it, the more we engage and the more we stretch our imagination, the better we become. You know? Yes. Uh, I got into interior decorating for a while. That became like a big thing. Hmm. You know, when I bought my first house, I was like, oh my God, I want to turn this into a wonderland. You know, <laughs> I got all crazy about that. So I watched a lot of HGTV. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, hey, that's inspiration like a lot. right there. 
like Lon, you know, like I'm sitting here going, okay, oh, I want to learn how to do faux painting. <gasps> I want to learn how to do Venetian plaster. <gasps> I want to learn how to do this. I want to learn how to do that. And, and so I would just sit and I would just watch. I would watch these TV shows. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to build that. Oh my God, I'm going to build that. Oh my God, I'm going to paint my room downstairs <laughs> just like that. You know, that's okay. how you, you just, you watch something and you get inspired and you get, ex- you get all fired up about it. And then you just jump in and get your feet wet. Lesson here is be open to the possibilities. They're all around you. You just got to be open yeah. to them and stop living in your little box because so many people do that, right? And, and you're the exact opposite. You're just always looking around and pulling from different possibilities, which is, which is great. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is awesome. So, uh, finally, where can, uh, where can more people find out about Luna Shimada if you have uh, social media, website? Now is the time to let us know. <laughs> Uh, my website is lunashimada.com or lunashimadamagic.com. Got it. I'll put a link and, down below. Um, I also have a Luna Shimada Facebook page. You know, if you Google me, I'm all over the place. You'll find me. <laughs> I'm not Shimada, hard to find. <laughs> the one and only. There's only one. And... Uh, Folks, you... well, there's actually another Luna Shimada out there who is apparently a, uh, an Asian recording artist. Really? I found out. Yes. I <laughs> okay. Was surprised. I was wrong. I take yeah. that back. But, so there's you two. Know, but yeah, there's two of us. There's a yeah. musician and a magician. And there you go. I'm sure both. Well, I, I know. I know you're immensely I'm, I'm, talented. I'm, I'm a little more famous. <laughs> a little so. more famous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, people will. People will Google away and they'll find out more. <laughs> they'll find me. <laughs> they will find you. Well, uh, thank you so much again for taking time of your busy day, just doing yeah. all that you do and uh, for being here for thank my you. audience. I greatly appreciate it. And thank uh, you. You guys have been watching another episode of Making Magic. Today, we've got Luna Shimada. If you've enjoyed this interview so far, feel free to click the subscribe button down below. You know what to do. If you're just listening to the sound of our voice on like the podcast apps like Spotify, where you might find us, feel free to follow the show if you want to have more inspiring interviews, just like the one that we had today with Luna. So think outside the box, get creative. And this has been another episode of Making Magic. We'll see you on the next one.